Two of the most recognisable and important figures in not only Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings, but the entire Legendarium, are Sauron and Aragorn. Both are so pivotal to the events of the story and unfolding of the Third Age's late history that Sauron is the eponymous Lord of the Rings, and Aragorn is the eponymous King, who returns in Books 5 and 6, Volume 3, The Return of the King. It can be argued that Gandalf the Wizard would be called the enemy of Sauron in the Third Age, but Aragorn represents the greatest threat to Sauron's desire for lordship, kingship and authority over the world of men, his antithesis. The Dark Lord is the self-proclaimed King of Men, King of Kings and Lord of the Earth, seizing his power and lordship by force. Aragorn is the descendant of great lords and kings, the chieftain of the Dúnedain, destined to become a king of men himself with a right to rule through divine ordination. His crowning would see the dignity of the kings of old renewed in Middle-earth. For two ages, Sauron, the former Maya of Auli, and later the servant and emissary of Morgoth, was the greatest opponent of peace in Middle-earth. But this Dark Lord rightly and wisely feared a mortal man in what he represented. Why would an immortal being with seemingly limitless resources and the strength of will to fulfil his grand design for Middle-earth, fear one of the second born. This is a discussion of Sauron's fear of Aragorn, the true king of men. It's a discussion of tyranny, kingship, lineage and the power a mortal man can hold over an immortal Maya who aided in the shaping of the world itself. A power over a tyrant who would witness those people he almost destroyed return from the shadows to stand against him. The great power residing in Mordor certainly knew fear, just as his master of old did. Those who hold power always fear losing it. But I think to fully understand Sauron's fear of Aragorn, one must reject and get out of the power rankings and hierarchies mindset, at least when it comes to positions of power and authority, and the fear of losing said power and authority. Tolkien's works in the modern world are admired, discussed and dissected, alongside not only other mythologies, but popular works of fiction that also include fantastical beings and creatures, other races sharing a world with the race of men. This leads to people discussing hypotheticals, confrontations and battles. I'd never say that people shouldn't do this, as everyone can enjoy discussing Tolkien in any way they wish. But I feel that these discussions end with talk of one race always beating another, a figure being more powerful. It all feels a bit too simple, with opposing sides just smashing weapons against each other. I'm not here to talk about a physical confrontation between Sauron and Aragorn, that's far less interesting than what both figures represent. But just want to clarify that in my opinion, when we talk of fear, apprehension, omens and destiny, the race of those involved doesn't matter. Sauron existed before Arda itself, being of the same race as those who, within Arda, became known as the Valar, but is himself of lesser stature as Amaya. When physical reality was brought into being, Sauron entered into it and has existed within Arda for thousands upon thousands of years. As one of the Ainur, he took part in the music of the Ainur that aided in the design of physical reality through Eru. Essentially, Sauron has a power of will, a position of authority and importance in the world that may be difficult for us mere mortals to fathom. With Aragorn, he is a mortal man, but he still seems like a mythological figure to us. Deep into the conflict of the Third Age against Sauron, the War of the Ring, he is old for a man, blessed in that regard as a true descendant of the Second Age Kingdom of Númenor, a land straight out of mythology. Still his age cannot be compared to Sauron's. Decades of experience against Aeons. Again, none of this has anything to do with Sauron fearing Aragorn and what he represents. There are no classes here or stats. Aragorn most definitely wields power. Different from Sauron's in many ways, but it's a power that Sauron himself recognised. And to repeat, like his master Morgoth, Sauron shares a divine origin with him, 
but also knows and understands the fears of the earth all too well. The power he holds and utilizes, the throne he has set himself upon in Middle Earth, can be removed. His great fear in the Third Age is someone bearing his master ring and setting themselves up in a position of power to challenge his own empire. Forget what adaptations tell you, the One Ring does not answer to Sauron alone. If it did, why would he fear certain figures bearing it? If no one could wield it and he couldn't comprehend someone destroying it, he wouldn't have made his fatal mistakes in the Third Age through his haste to obtain the ring again, especially since he could crush his enemies through militaristic might without the ring. Sauron's enemies in the Third Age can muster the strength of will to use it. In some cases they would not be able to bend it completely to their will, which would end Sauron's reign without him having to even meet them. There may not be enough time to master it completely before Sauron arrives in force to take it. But with the ability to utilize the ring, according to their stature, they could set themselves up in opposition to Sauron, gathering friends, allies and armies through their own newfound authority. Figures like Gandalf and Galadriel could certainly challenge, but Aragorn could muster quite an opposition as a leader of men under his own banner. This highlights his importance as he really does something similar without the need for a ring. Gandalf tells us this, Now Sauron knows all this, and he knows that this precious thing which he lost has been found again, but he does not yet know where it is, or so we hope, and therefore he is now in great doubt, for if we have found this thing, there are some among us with strength enough to wield it, that too he knows. For do I not guess rightly, Aragorn, that you have shown yourself to him in the stone of Orthanc? I have already said that it does not matter that Sauron is an immortal Maya and Aragorn is a mortal man when it comes to conflict and the possibility of a defeat for Sauron. But I want to be equally clear when I say that for the race of men and other races of Middle-earth, lineage, bloodlines and ancestry do matter. Those descending from great and noble heroes and blessed figures are certainly more likely to have heroic characteristics, perhaps with a greater chance of falling from grace. Even witnessing and basking in the light of the two trees of Valinor before their destruction set certain elves apart from those who never left Middle-earth and elevated them to greatness among an entire race. Being a Numenorian, living physically closer to the Blessed Realm than men of Middle-earth, could potentially shape the lives of men who hadn't even been born yet. Even among the little people such as the hobbits, traditionally not considered great heroes and legendary figures, at least before certain figures demonstrated otherwise, Frodo and Bilbo have it in their blood to be adventurous and to seek out something beyond the ordinary, the Brandybuck influence for the former and the Took influence for the latter. They are the greatest the Shire has to offer and they are fit to even consider the monumental quests they undertake, otherwise they'd have stayed behind. Frodo is even described in the story as being the best hobbit in the Shire, according to Bilbo and Gandalf, and he demonstrates his strength of character through the hardship of his journey in the Lord of the Rings, hardship that countless other hobbits, despite their own bravery, would succumb to long before ever reaching the land of Mordor. Just a note on that, Fate Bulger is a hero in his own right despite staying behind when Frodo and his friends make their way out of the Shire. Courage can manifest itself in different ways. Talk of bloodlines and lineage seems to make many uncomfortable, to the point where the author himself can get accused of endorsing the strength of one bloodline over another. I'll be honest and say that in the context of the Legendarium, it doesn't bother me at all. The Lord of the Rings and the Legendarium as a whole offer us Tolkien's mythopoeic imagination spread over decades of writing. The influence of archaic views of rule, nobility and heroism from Norse tradition, the Anglo-Saxons and others is more than apparent to anyone who has even a slight interest in ancient tales spread through the centuries, inheriting potential and possibly even a destiny shaped by your parents and ancestors, Heracles and Zeus. Poseidon and Theseus, Arthur and Uther Pendragon, Romulus and Remus and Mars, 
and far more through different traditions. In some cases, even character and personality are predetermined through lineage, something that is discovered and awoken from within. Tolkien scholar Tom Shippey explains this well in J.R.R. Tolkien, Author of the Century. The idea that Tolkien's extended genealogies and very detailed family trees tell us more than just where a figure came from, but aspects of their very character, and sometimes the role they may have played in the history of Arda. His analysis of the legendary maker of the Silmarils, Fëanor, paints him as a focused and creative individual, but also selfish, the child of two parents of the Noldor in Valinor. His role in the Silmarillion certainly demonstrates his greatness and his faults as the son of Finwë and Miriel. Fëanor's half-brothers, Fingolfin and Finarfin, have a different mother of the Vanyar, not the Noldor. Shippy argues that this makes them greater than Fëanor in their humility and ability to handle their emotions. An interesting thought that highlights, in my opinion, the tragedy of Fingolfin, when he succumbs eventually to grief and arguably madness, when he rides to challenge Morgoth directly, believing his people are destroyed. Restraint no longer being possible, emotion overwhelming him. Fingolfin's children are of mixed heritage, the Noldor and the Vanyar. They have a reckless nature while still being generous in their friendships to those whom others may not be so quick to befriend. We then have Fëanor's sons, pure children of the Noldor. In general, they share their father's aggressive nature. They are headstrong, and I would say passionate, but all are great in their own way, destined to be famous or infamous. The view of ancestry playing a role in your character is common in fairy tales, mythology, and classical or ancient stories. I don't see it as reflecting some aspect of Tolkien's characters when it comes to views of races in our modern world and their place within it. That's my reading of the text, but others vehemently disagree. Let's take a look at Aragorn's lineage and bloodline since I have claimed it is important. By the time we reach the events of the Lord of the Rings in the late Third Age, Aragorn is the chieftain of the Dúnedain, the hereditary rulers of the Rangers of the North, the North Kingdom of the Dúnedain once being Arnor, the royal land. This was a kingdom founded by the legendary High King Elendil after the arrival of the Men of the West from a downfall in Númenor in the late Second Age. Arnor itself did survive the fall of Elendil in the War of the Last Alliance and the death of Elendil's son, Isildur, who ruled as its king for only two years before the disaster of the Gladden Fields, where Isildur lost his life and the One Ring of Sauron. This happened in the opening years of the Third Age, and Arnor would change dramatically in the ninth century of that age, after the death of its tenth king, Erendur. In Lyrian fashion, the children of the king, sons in this case, all made a claim for the kingdom, claiming the right to rule. This led to the fragmentation of the greater kingdom, Arnor, into three, Arthurin, Cardolan, and Rudar. Sauron's greatest servant, the Witch King, made war on these kingdoms, but it is Arthurdain that is important in terms of Aragorn's lineage. The Ringwraith made war on Arthurdain for centuries, and it led to the abandonment of it in the year 1974 of the Third Age. It did only take a year for him to be driven out, but the damage was done, and Arthurdain did not return. The Dúnedain of Arthurdain became the Rangers of the North. The last official king of Arthurdain was Arvidu, a name with the ominous meaning of last king. It was said that he was named by a seer, Malbeth, a figure who made two distinct prophecies related to the fate of the Dúnedain. The second foretold a figure who would later be Aragorn and a passage through the paths of the dead, an event that wouldn't take place for a millennium from the time of Malbeth but one that was pivotal for the return of the king. A passage through a land of the dead in Middle-earth's harrowing of Hades or Hell, Aragorn, the Rejuvenator. The first prophecy was in the naming of Arvidu, with Malbeth advising the 14th king, Arafant, to give his son this name. Arvidu you shall call him, for he will be the last in Arthedain, though a choice will come to the Dúnedain, 
and if they take the one that seems less hopeful, then your son will change his name and become king of a great realm. If not, then much sorrow and many lives of men shall pass, until the Dúnedain arise and are united again. Arvidui was the last king, but the kingdom ended in ruin. He fled when the Witch King invaded and died by the Bay of Forchel. His son, Aranarth, did not claim the kingship of the Fallen Kingdom, but later rode against Angmar with Eärnur of Gondor as the first chieftain of the Dúnedain. Make no mistake, Aranarth was a king in all but name, a man of great royal and noble lineage. Aranarth and his descendants can all be traced back to Isildur, being of the House of Isildur. From Isildur as the son of Elendil, to his surviving son Valandil following his death, through all the kings of Arnor, to Amlaith, first of Arthedain, to Arvidu, the last king of Arthedain. Isildur is an important figure when we speak of Aragorn and lineage, the figure who claimed the One Ring, a king of Gondor alongside his brother Anarion, and briefly the High King, which includes being king of Arnor itself. We can go back further into mythological territory. Not only does Aragorn descend from a mighty line of kings, traced back through both the North and South Kingdoms, and the Lost Kingdom of Numenor to the West, but we can trace Aragorn back to Erendil the Mariner and Elwing. To call Erendil a legendary hero is an understatement, and through these figures we can go back further to Thingol and the Maya Melian. Aragorn's line does not just contain the greatest heroes and kings of the greatest realms of men, but high elves and kings among them, and even an immortal angelic spirit of Sauron's order too. Isildur, Elendil, Elros, Erendil, Dior, Beren, Luthien, Thingol, Melian, these are just some of the names listed in the ancestry of Aragorn. It's easy to then say that Aragorn is almost more than a man at least symbolically, declaring himself as the Renewer, the Envin Yatar. He is the Elisar, the Elfstone. His lineage and nobility are not up for debate, and I'd go as far as to say that Aragorn is the greatest that the race of men can offer in the Third Age, the true king set against the false, the tyrant. He shares in the strength of those who directly challenged Sauron, and those who challenged his fallen master Morgoth, a bloodline carried through generations of heroes for thousands of years, until the time was right for Aragorn to step forward when destiny called. He is not one of those men Gandalf speaks of when we hear talk of the men of the West mingling with lesser men, the middlemen of Middle-earth. He is a true representative of Westerness, the blood of Numenor runs true within him, a line Sauron did not extinguish through his actions on the Isle that led to rebellion against the Valar. But in the wearing of the swift years of Middle-earth, the line of Meneldil, son of Anarion, failed, and the tree withered, and the blood of the Numenorians became mingled with that of lesser men. Perhaps the greatest symbol of Aragorn's position in the world and the threat to Sauron is the sword Anduril, the Flame of the West. Originally this sword was the famous blade called Narsil, forged by the legendary smith of Nogrod, Telkar. This was a blade that shone with the light of the sun and moon, filling dark foes with fear thousands of years in the past. Following Elendil's fall at the end of the Second Age, it became the blade that was broken, its shards being carried and held with honour, being passed through generations until finally being given to Aragorn. And when the time was right, and all signs pointed to an incoming final conflict against Sauron, the blade was reforged in Rivendell. Throughout the Lord of the Rings, Aragorn would carry his birthright with him as a weapon when the Company of the Rings set out on their journey. Not only did the original blade cut the One Ring from Sauron, but it still exists in the world, reforged. When I say that Sauron fears this blade, it's not just because of the memory of his defeat at the end of the Second Age, it is because it's a symbol held by his enemies, a reminder of the men of the West who still offer him resistance. The broken blade symbolises the broken kindred with the fall of Elendil, the legendary High King, despite temporarily defeating the Dark Lord in Mordor. It is more than a weapon, 
it is an omen that the Dúnedain still stand, they exist in defiance of Sauron and his tyranny. That broken blade representing the decline of men has been made whole again. It inspires hope, and hope is a weapon that Sauron fears, a weapon and shield he cannot overcome by force. I personally see Anduril as Aragorn's crown before he is crowned. No ordinary man would carry this. A relic, a treasure, a mythological weapon carried in the Third Age. Aragorn carrying this symbolises change, the turning of the tide, and the return of the king. And with Aragorn's inherent power, majesty and kingly presence, it's almost like he can reveal the sword and rally men to fight for him, without the need for a ring of power, without forcing men to side with him. This is a great weapon against the will of Sauron. We see this power on display when Aragorn meets Eomer of Rohan, a man who later becomes a king himself, a proud and noble warrior. Aragorn reveals his true name, no longer wandering in the wilds as Strider, but as Aragorn, son of Arathorn. He holds aloft the blade that was broken, and those witnessing this moment are awestruck. Aragorn threw back his cloak, the elven sheath glittered as he grasped it, and the bright blade of Anduril shone like a sudden flame as he swept it out. Elendil, he cried, I am Aragorn, son of Arathorn, and am called Elisar, the Elfstone, Dunedain, the heir of Isildur, Elendil's son of Gondor. Here is the sword that was broken and is forged again. Will you aid me or thwart me? Choose swiftly. Eomer seems to shrink in the face of Aragorn, who looks to grow in stature. A brief vision of the majesty of the kings of stone. Legolas sees a white flame flickering on the brows of Aragorn, as if he wears a shining crown. He carries himself as a king before he is ever crowned, showing us that while Sauron can make the claim to be not just a king of men, but the king of men, Aragorn has the right to be a king, through not only his lineage, but in the way he acts. A king of men when faced with the burden and responsibility of such a title. He carries himself this way throughout the War of the Ring, feeling that the time is right to no longer remain as a hidden hope for his people, inspiring others when faced with the threat of Mordor. The flame of the West is not only the sword, but the man who wields it. Since the day when you rose before me out of the green grass of the Downs, I have loved you, and that love shall not fail. Another failing of Sauron's and a strength held by Aragorn is the love others have for him, his friendships and his alliances. The words quoted are spoken by Eomer of Rohan following the victory of the West over Sauron. They meet in happier times, and Eomer says that between them there can be no word of giving or taking nor of reward, for they are brothers. They will not fail each other, nor will their kingdoms. In the War of the Ring, Aragorn helped draw Sauron's enemies together with no threats, no treacherous gifts or false promises, all while Sauron uses and abuses his strength of will and the might of Mordor to force others into slavery and worship. Orcs become almost powerless to resist and are drawn from afar under his banner and men born into hate for the West march from their homes in distant lands to fight and die for Sauron's personal glory and power. Aragorn has his allies and friends, Gimli the Dwarf, Legolas the Elf, and Gandalf the Wizard, all fighting for him. Sauron has fear, terror, and an iron fist, while Aragorn displays nobility, love, camaraderie, and healing. The Dark Lord then struggles to separate his enemies and attempt to defeat them one by one, divide and conquer. His fear is then justified as Middle-earth begins to unite against him, under the guidance of figures like Aragorn. The hope of the West overcomes the fear of Mordor and Sauron. The kingdoms in exile, Gondor and Arnor, are those realms founded by the exiles of Numenor who escaped its downfall. Sauron himself played his part in the end of Numenor's days. The exiles are those faithful who never turned from Eru, the Valar, or their friends the Elves. They were never swayed by Sauron and he failed to deceive them. Their existence is a reminder of his hatred for them and his failure. And while Arnor and its subsequent lesser kingdoms failed, Gondor still stood 
in the time of the Lord of the Rings. The greatest threat to Sauron despite their current stature not matching the early days of its splendour. But again it still stands, and as long as it stands, it is a banner men can gather under against Sauron. For generations, Gondor has not had a king, but stewards. Aragorn can change this. He has the ability and authority to become king. Reunite the great kingdoms in exile, restoring a royal line of kings and ushering in the age of men as elves continue to dwindle and leave the shores of Middle-earth. As heir of Isildur, Aragorn can undo centuries upon centuries of decline. He is the rejuvenator. His acceptance as leader of the armies of the West against Sauron continues him on the path to becoming recognised as king. Sauron fears this. Gondor without a king is weaker than with one, especially a king that seems destined to ascend to the throne. All signs that Sauron will be defeated. Then Gandalf said, Let us not stay at the door, for the time is urgent. Let us enter. For it is only in the coming of Aragorn that any hope remains for the sick that lie in this house. Thus spake Eorith, wise woman of Gondor. The hands of the king are the hands of a healer, and so shall the rightful king be known. What else could Sauron possibly fear? Well, the Dark Lord would recognise the strength of Aragorn through his lineage. He's one of the few Sauron would fear in potentially claiming the One Ring to use against him, leading a great host to Mordor and uniting Middle-earth under Aragorn as their lord. Yes, Tolkien is clear that in the presence of Sauron, few of equal stature could ever hope to hold the ring from him, and none of mortal race could. But this isn't what we're talking about here. Sauron would fear what Aragorn could achieve with the ring, the damage he could do if he took it, the delay to Sauron's victory. With his newfound authority, his majesty would be a dark and overwhelming majesty. Hosts of men from far and wide would join him, their powerful king, a king of kings, a reminder of the likes of Arpharazon the Golden of Numenor, who terrified Sauron's forces in the past when leading hosts of grim and determined men to Sauron's door. All would fall under the authority of Aragorn, a naturally great leader who already draws people to him now boosted by the confidence and strength as a ring-bearer. The West and possibly other regions could unite to overthrow Sauron, to place their new lord in his seat of power. Of course, we know that Aragorn would not do this, but Sauron held power above all else. He would not think anyone would give up power or refuse it. He only cared about those who held power laying claim to the Master Ring, as they would be the ones who could make use of it and could possibly defeat him with it. It's what he would do, and he sees himself as the wisest. Other wise figures would follow suit, surely. We know this from Gandalf's words to Frodo after being openly offered the ring. The ability of those with power to utilise the great power of the One Ring. Unless some other seized it and became possessed of it, if that happened, the new possessor could, if sufficiently strong and heroic by nature, challenge Sauron, become master of all that he had learned or done since the making of the One Ring, and so overthrow him and usurp his place. When Sauron's forces were defeated at Minas Tirith, and Aragorn seized control of the Palantir from Sauron, that Aragorn rightfully owned, the Dark Lord feared Aragorn had taken the ring. He definitely fears the power of this mortal man. His fear was only lessened somewhat by his belief that Aragorn was naive and hasty, marching to Mordor far sooner than he should with the ring he supposedly held, not knowing that the faith Sauron held in power only was being used against him while the ring made its way closer to Mount Doom. I have spent a lot of time explaining why Sauron feared Aragorn. I want to dedicate this final section to a moment that demonstrates his quality to us, a way we can compare Aragorn to Sauron, the true king and the false, to just reiterate that his mortality or kindred should not be held against him as some weakness in this battle against a great power, a great evil. The Lord of the Rings provides us with a perfect example of Aragorn's kingly nature before he is crowned. Not just with the sword that he carries, the allies that follow him, the blood that runs through his veins, but his actions and choices. Following his journey through the paths of the dead and his arrival at the Battle of the Pelennor, a council is held. In this last debate, it was decided that a force we call the Army of the West 
would march for the Black Gate, instead of lingering at Minas Tirith to await an even greater assault by the forces of Sauron. With the winds in favour of turning against Sauron following the reforging of the blade that was broken, Aragorn revealed the defeat of a great army in the first assault and the fall of his great servant the Witch King, Gandalf offers some insight into the mind of Sauron. If they make themselves the bait, Sauron can't resist taking it and hope and greed. He will believe that this new ring lord can be trapped and crushed, too eager to march to Mordor to take his throne. Then the Dark Lord will have what was taken and keep it forever. We must walk open-eyed into that trap with courage, but small hope for ourselves. For my lords, it may well prove that we ourselves shall perish utterly in a black battle far from the living lands, so that even if Baradur be thrown down, we shall not live to see a new age. But this I deem is our duty, and better so than to perish nonetheless, as we surely shall, if we sit here and know as we die that no new age shall be. A host marches out of Athelion with no hope of a victory through strength of arms. The host is a distraction, and if he is distracted then Mordor empties, and the ring bearer has a greater, yet still slim, chance of reaching Mount Doom. This is the last hope for defeating Sauron, and as the host passes into the desolate lands before the gates of the pass of Kirith Gorgor, it becomes too much to bear for some of the men. This is understandable. For many, Mordor was a name only found in stories and legends, a name that few would even speak aloud. A land of such great evil that Tolkien describes the march to it as a hideous dream made true. Men preparing for a battle that is more likely to be a slaughter. A land of horror far from home, where they will be cruelly slain and left buried under ash. The dread of Mordor isn't just described to us by the author as some narrator. We get to experience it through the characters. In The Lord of the Rings, we often share that feeling of awe and wonder as characters experience the landscapes, history and mythology before us. It's why places like Lothlorien, Khazad Dûm and Ladris are so memorable, or monuments to history like the Argonath, homes of kings like Minas Tirith and Edoras. But this works in the other direction. We get to experience the hopelessness and terror through a shared vision with characters, the approach to the Black Gate, the Paths of the Dead, Shelob's Lair, the Plateau of Gorgoroth, Minas Morgul. And this is when Aragorn allows those figures too frightened to continue the chance to leave. They can even hold their honour if they refuse to run, and if they are willing to make their way south to Kerandros, retaking it if enemies hold it, or help defend it for Gondor and Rohan. His mercy is so effective in this moment that some of the men who were overwhelmed overcome their fear and stay, motivated to fight. And for those who do leave, they are inspired and filled with hope to attempt a deed that they feel is within their measure. Then some being shamed by his mercy overcame their fear and went on, and the others took new hope, hearing of a manful deed within their measure that they could turn to, and they departed. And so since many men had already been left at the crossroads, it was with less than six thousands that the captains of the west came at last to challenge the Black Gate and the might of Mordor. This is reminiscent of something Tolkien would clearly be familiar with. Deuteronomy chapter 20 verse 8. Chapter 20 offers rules for warfare, and verse 8, written in different ways depending on the version, says in essence that if anyone is frightened or faint-hearted in the face of war, let him go home lest his brethren's heart faint as well as his. If these men under Aragorn's authority are forced to continue on to the Black Gate, they may flee. In fact, there's a good chance they could flee with or without Aragorn's say, fear and terror overwhelming them. And if that happens, others may inevitably join them, seeing the situation as hopeless, when hope is their greatest weapon in this scenario. The entire army could be negatively affected and morale could be crushed before Sauron even makes a move. It reminds me of the hoplites of ancient battlefields, carrying shields that protect themselves and the man to the left. One has to be strong and steadfast to protect themselves, others and the entire army. A weak link can lead to utter defeat. While bravery may inspire others to be brave, 
Fear may inspire fear. Aragorn acting as a king makes a decision. He understands the authority he holds over these men who have followed him so soon after a battle in Gondor. He must make the decision as a leader of men. Despite needing them in an already meagre force in terms of numbers. Pity, mercy, understanding, but also thinking ahead to the battle that is to come. He manages to inspire hope in men who choose to stay or go. A decision that Sauron just could not and would not make. Aragorn asks without commanding, appealing to duty and honour. This whole event shows Aragorn as the merciful and just king that is to come. He is the opposite of Sauron, doing what is right beyond just militaristic needs, while still considering them. These deeds will help shape the world in which he will hold the authority of a king of men, a world that will rebuild if and when Sauron is defeated. To act otherwise is to act like Sauron. He could, under pain of death, command them to fight, but again Aragorn is not Sauron. No one witnessing this or later hearing about it would doubt Aragorn. He fights alongside those walking into danger. He sets the example, making tough choices, fighting to bring justice to a world plagued by the tyrant. His actions on the way to Mordor show the change that is coming. He is displaying the power he holds that Sauron would envy and could never hope to hold himself, a power over men without having to threaten. Sauron's soldiers are pawns, disposable servants to be replaced if they fall. Few would willingly fight for him without the fear of torment, and others have no choice but to fight for him, overwhelmed by his cruel will. Did Sauron fear Aragorn? Yes. Without Aragorn, Middle-earth may have crumbled and defeat, Sauron standing victorious without even having to gain the One Ring. Hope is the greatest weapon against evil in the Lord of the Rings, and Aragorn himself is a symbol of that hope, even being given the name Hope, Estel. Cementing alliances, leading men into battle following a pilgrimage through Dunharo, inspiring hope in a war that may have been lost in despair before a weapon was drawn. Sauron was wise to fear the return of the king, the greatest of the race he wished to rule and dominate, a descendant of men who inspired awe in Sauron for their accomplishments, admiration that quickly turned to anger and the desire to rule and destroy them. Aragorn was the fire woken from the ashes, the light from the shadows, carrying the renewed blade, and in defeating the Dark Lord, the true king returned. Thank you for watching or listening to my discussion of Sauron's fear of Aragorn, the true king. I want to thank those who support me in making content like this. Patricia for her continued support, SK for supporting through the Numenor tier on Patreon, and for those who very generously support on the highest tier Valinor through Patreon, Oliver, Victus, Moses, and NCV93. As always, Everything I have shared here has been through my own research and interpretation of Tolkien's works. All references, including text sources, music and artists, are available to you in descriptions and on screen. Thank you. <laughs>